we have our last session. I'm super excited for these three guys. Anytime you have two uh, Navy SEALs and an Australian gentleman who like is super intimidating. I met these guys at the, when, we were, when I was outside and they were talking about their intro. They really told me what to say. There wasn't like, here's a suggestion. I was like, okay, whatever you guys want. Still shook my hand, he was like, ah. Um, well, these guys are gonna talk about human perform, uh, they're our human performance panel. And these guys have really mastered um, human potential and tapped into a system and strategies on how to overcome your fear and how we can all be better versions of ourselves and tackle things and go beyond what we thought our perceived limitations were. And each one of these gentlemen have unique experience and backgrounds in, uh, I'll let them explain and talk about their backgrounds rather than me try to sell them. But all I could say is the resumes are unbelievable. They all have deep military, government, security, human potential, um, experience at the highest level, as I said, in the SEAL program, military, overseas, et cetera. So I wanna introduce uh, Andrew Walsh first. Come on up, Andrew. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> Jurgen Heitman and Brian Ferguson. And rather than, yeah. First of all, thank you guys for your service. Appreciate that, come on up. And rather than me uh, read the bios, which I think would do an injustice to what you guys have all done, maybe take a seat and just spend a minute before you guys start and just give quick backgrounds. Is that okay? Cool. Okay. Thank you, guys. That's a little intimidating, wouldn't you say? <laughs> we hadn't seen it, so thanks to whoever put that together for us. Well, hey guys, good afternoon. So uh, obviously a privilege for us to be here. Um, grateful to Henry and, and the crew for bringing us out. But in terms of our backgrounds, I think it'll come out as we explore a narrative here for, for the next hour and a half or hour and 15 minutes. But you know, I think in the spirit of what Colin did this morning and in the spirit of Limitless, there's often a sexiness to these adventures and to pushing the edges. And one of the things we thought we'd do, each of us has had a kind of a respective career and some component of human potential and performance. And we thought we'd talk more about the philosophy and the lessons and the virtues and values that, that underpin that, that end up being relevant to all of us, whether we're climbing mountains or whether we're pushing our own edges. Um, and so we've compiled, I think, some really neat lessons that each of us have learned or lessons we've learned in other communities that we've been privileged to work in. Uh, I want to say, so, so a bit about myself quickly, I, the first part of my career was in national security, so I was a civilian working kind of in defense and, and intelligence, and then I went into the military later and, and was privileged to serve in special operations. But my last job was actually looking at how do we, how do we, number one, bring emerging technology into the world of special operations, but number two, how do we look at the future of performance in that world? Uh, and I had this amazing kind of dream job if I wasn't operational, and that was to go out well beyond the military and to meet people who were doing things at the cutting edge of understanding what are we capable of as humans, as individuals and as teams. Uh, and so one of the first places I went was to meet with Dr. Andy Walsh uh, at Red Bull. And so if any of you don't know, uh, Andy ironically is an Australian surfer who ended up coaching the U.S. ski team. Um, so he's, he's known, if, if you know anyone in the world of skiing, Andy's a legend. Uh, and really built the center for excellence. And, and one of the things that he did there was to just fundamentally think differently about a sport that was rooted in legacy. And as, if you get a chance to talk to Andy, whether you're running a business, whether you're in medicine or the military, we all get anchored in our own legacy. And so how do we, get, how do we think beyond what we're comfortable in? Uh, and Andy was brilliant at doing this. And so he then went to, to run something called Red Bull Stratos, which was of many, how many of you saw the skydive from space? Right? So Felix Baumgartner, Andy ran the performance side of that program and did some extraordinary things and, and then started working in, with the special operations community. Uh, and one of the things that I started to learn from Andy was how do we explore our edges through things like creativity and making ourselves uncomfortable, what, what, no matter what we do. Uh, so Andy left Red Bull recently and, and Jurgen and I have been privileged to come together and work with Andy under the, the banner of Logitech and uh, a larger umbrella that's looking at if we were to build a world-class institute it was dedicated to exploring our edges for individuals and teams and professional sports, what might that look like? Uh, and we're really privileged to have an amazing community of people who are, who are looking at how do we make an impact in the world by thinking about the future human potential. 
Uh, so I think we'll dive in. And, and Jurgen Heitman, uh, I, I, I will say that I was, just to be clear, Jurgen and I are both out of the military now. Uh, I served for seven years. I had a short, a short career in special operations. I will tell you unequivocally, uh, a lot of what you see in books and movies today is a bit overhyped, particularly when it comes to the SEAL community. The thing that is that often isn't spoken about is this quiet humility of being a quiet professional and just being extraordinary at what you do and every day getting up wanting to be a little bit better. And when I served, Jurgen Heitman was the type of person that I wanted to be like as an officer. So he had an extraordinary 33 years in special operations, did a number of amazing things. Uh, but today we're going to contextualize all of that in a way hopefully that feels accessible to all of you and, and is woven into lessons, both from the world of military, from medicine, professional sport, and business. Uh, so again, I think we're, we're all incredibly grateful and, uh, and feel privileged to, to share the last hour of the day here with you. So I'll turn it over to Andy. Well, great, guys. Can we bring the lights up? We're going we're gonna to try. We know it's the end of the day, and we know how everyone's typically feeling. So, yeah, can you guys bring the lights up for a second? A little precursor for what we want to do later today in the workshop after, a little taster. So get yourself relaxed. Take three or four nice, calming breaths. When you're done, I'm going to count you into a little breath hold. I want to see how long you guys can hold your breath for, OK? So I'm going to count you down. All right, everyone ready? You can't. It's completely safe. All good. All right? All right. Couple of breaths, relax. Three, two, one, and take a deep breath in. And hold. By the way, don't black out, breathe when you feel you need to. <laughs> All right, we're coming down, that's 15 seconds. No cheating either. That's 30 seconds. Put your hands up if you're still holding your breath. Keep your hand up. As you let go, we'll see who's the last person standing. All right, nice. Coming up to 45 seconds. Still a few hands up. Oh, they're starting to drop now. Coming in, that's a minute, well done. Everyone who made a minute. Anyone still going? Good amount. Yeah, good amount. Uh, <laughs> still going, I still see three hands. Last one up singing the national anthem, by the way, so. Oh, he's still got some people going at the back. Make sure they're not cheating. I hear some heavy yeah, breathing some... going on back there. All right, we're at a minute and a half. Anyone still going? Yeah. There's a couple. Oh, hey. Yeah. Two more. We just, we, we just needed to fill some time in our presentation. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're coming up to... All right, in the one back. more. So one person left. Two. That's two minutes. Well done. There he goes. He's up. Uh, and we All have right. a winner. Well done. A couple of minutes. I didn't get the clicker. Let's see if we can get it. Um, so that's a little preview of what we're going to do after the lesson and after the presentation. But it's sort of thematic to what we want to talk about today. And that's the idea that. Once you understand human factors, and, and we've got the opportunity over many years to look at the, some of the very best in the world across all sorts of domains, not just you'll see a heavy influence on sport and a bit of military here today, but once you get to understand how they do things, the, the tools and techniques, as Brian said, that they've developed are very accessible to everybody. And I will, we just did this on Monday at another business conference. People started at 30, 40, 45, 50 seconds, maybe a minute. At the end, two people, five and a half minutes in under an hour. So we encourage those. We've got, I think, 15 signed up at the end. We need another 10 people to come and join us. We'll show you how to do it very simply and very supportively so it's not a punishable, punishable event. All right. Um, so I'm going to kick this off tonight. And again, thanks to everyone for the time, the end of the day here. The sort of slide behind us is sort of a cue for us to sort of reference in where we see this whole idea of human potential uh, leading. And the notion is that 
in historical perspectives, that was a sort of trajectory. Evolutionary models dominated how people evolved, grew, and developed as a species. But that's all changing very dramatically right now. And it's changing for a couple of big reasons. One is uh, our understanding of how people are performing at the very top of their game is being accessed in a way now, thanks to technology, the, the wearables, the science, the research that's going on, so that we are now pulling apart and peeling back the layers of the highest performers in the world in ways we've never had access to before. So that means we understand now more than we ever have, and even in the last five or 10 years, that growth has been exponential. So for the first time in history, we understand more about how people perform at the top of the game. The second thing that's happening, and this is on, a, on, the, on one far end of the spectrum, through things like genetic engineering and CRISPR technology, but more importantly, through just behavioural changes through th technologies like the iWatch and things like that that cue you to improve certain aspects of your life. We can now impact in a way we've never had the opportunity to before on how people are changing and modifying and improving. So we've got this massive increase in knowledge around human factors, and we've got these technologies and, uh, and, and systems and understandings that allow us now to manipulate that in ways we've never had before. So now we're in charge of this evolution. And this is something that's never happened before in human history. And you can think about it. I won't reflect on whether it's a good or a bad thing, but definitely it's up to us, I think, to start to think about how we want to navigate our own space in that type. So, you know, we, uh, we want to keep it fun today. So the next thing is a quick slide, a quick uh, video here. And it's all about pushing the edge. And you'll see a video here. This is Limitless. It's about understanding limits, pushing limits. So this is a video of one of the old groups that we worked with at Red Bull at a certain period of time. You get to see here some people pushing the very edge, and I think it just sets the stage. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy. Think about that for a second. You have an idea, to many people it appears crazy, whether it's in sport, business, life. How do you take that idea, something you've never done before, that challenge out in front of you that seems impossible to everyone, it's never been done before. How do you navigate that space to allow you the greatest amount of success and particularly getting there to that end game, especially when so many people around you probably even say it can't ever be done. And so what we want to do today, as Brian said, is dissect a little bit of that for you in the context of how it would apply to you and the simple things that we've learned over the years that allow people who are pushing the edge, who are pushing the limits, if you like, of what's possible in their given field or area of mastery, and how do we 
share that information more broadly with people such as yourself so that you can take some of those cues and uh, work with them. Jürgen, anything to add there? No, I think, you know, like Brian highlighted, you know, we're pri privileged to have grown up in cultures that really strive and live in this concept of this pursuit of excellence in everything we do. And I think it was discussed this morning, definitely with Colin and the mountaineering um, aspect of, of what is done. And, and with that mindset comes everything that you think about, how you make decisions, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And more importantly, how do you train to that? So everything you're doing, you're training towards. And whether it's in business, whether it's in sport, whether it's in military, whether it's in medicine, you become this very technically proficient person. But if you start reimagining this moment in time and really thinking about how complex and how fast people are learning, it's really not being a, an amazing technician, you know, and really good at what you do. It's, it's how good you become an expert, expert learner. And that's really where you take it to a whole nother level. And where you learn and you look to push the edges outside of the realm that you work in. So in our community, we're constantly, as Brian said, have, have the unique opportunity to go out to other places, step out of groupthink, and look at amazing performers across different aspects of business and sport and other entities, and find those attributes that are completely agnostic to us, but those triggers and that creativity and that innovation that sets those individuals apart to think always on the edge, and then apply back in that into the community. So that's, that's a lot of the stuff we'll, we'll hit here today. And real quick on that last video, by the way, if you guys are ever bored or need Tom on a plane to download some videos, this, this was Andy's job for, what, about 10 years, this kind of crazy stuff. Um, but whether it was Sean White in the half pipe, downhill skiing, Ian Walsh on big waves, that it was this sort of crazy, bold, cutting edge idea coming to life in an extreme way. And you watch that video and it's obviously a lot of fun. I don't know if any of you noticed the, the nose dive the plane was in. So if, are there any wingsuiters in here, by the way? Yeah, we can teach you, you never that know. if you want. Uh, that but those guys are more. dropping altitude really quickly. So that plane's in it. So you start to think about the complexity and the risk they're in to plan. And so you can imagine why a community like Special Operations wants to go learn. And, and what you'll hear us talk a lot about today is, is how do we build these communities? If, you're, if we're pushing our own limit, how do we find the right community to, to learn in, as, as Jurgen's saying? But the other thing that Andy did amazingly at Red Bull was start to think about different models. So behind us uh, is one of the, my favorites. This was how we started to look at things, again, in the military and special operations. And personally, the way I look at human potential, what's the difference between human performance and human potential? Human performance is really what we're capable of now and what we do every day. Human potential is what we're capable of over the arc of our lives. Right? And, and really, you know, to, to Marshall's earlier comment, this is about getting outside of that comfort zone. And one of the things, typically, when you, when you hear people, especially in special operations pro sport, it's about usually 90% is the body, and we talk a little bit about the mind. But Andy really started to push us to think about a model that transcended that. And so we've got things up here like spirituality, right? technology. Think about the iPhone wasn't around 10 years ago. You think about what, how much our lives have changed in terms of measuring what we're capable of today. Nutrition, we start, to, we start to think more broadly about psychology, sports psychology, et cetera. And so this model becomes a way, if we're gonna do something, is whether that's climbing a mountain, wingsuiting into an aircraft, or something in our own lives, what models do we have so that we can understand our weaknesses and our strengths and start to train in those areas that are outside of our comfort zone? Yeah, Brian, uh, nailed it there. The idea that if, so, if I came to you and say, hey, tomorrow we need you, someone to train you to train these guys to jump out off, a, off the side of a mountain and jump through a window of a plane that's flying alongside them, the, the whole complexity of that exercise is daunting. It's overwhelming. It's like that big, big, those goals in your life that seem just too far ahead to reach. So the models allow us to do a bunch of things, as Brian mentioned, but more, most importantly, they simplify the complexity of these concepts. So they give us a, a, an anchoring point. So we can put a, a person, an organisation, whatever framework, a team you like in the middle of these models and we try and identify what's important in terms of success in that particular uh, activity or particular career path. And then we break it down and try and make it simple so we can attack the problem step by step by step and then we just work it through. And it's all about progressions. You don't just go up on the hill one day, jump off and hope to get in the window. You basically... Uh, well, some people might, but it's not, I, I guarantee the success rate's not going to be very high. So you think about how do we plan it, how do we prepare, how do we execute on a complex idea, and, and then bring it to life. Um, and Co Jürgen, anything on that one? No, that's, that's good. Well, um, we'll talk about it in a future slide here about, again, the same comment that was just made prior, you know, how do you think big but act small? And it's those small steps that's really the performance mind state. 
So it's important that we don't just talk. The, I, I, we, we face a little bit of criticism over the years. Like you're only working with elite. All the elite can do this. The elite aren't as elite as, as mysterious as people think. They've just worked at it. They've worked out paths. They've worked out models. And they're very patient and they're obviously very disciplined. But everything we do at the elite level translates directly back down the pipeline to either yourselves or kids or whoever it may be and across disciplines in that manner as well. So the next clip is another person pushing the edges of what they think is possible. And I just want you to think about and how to draw the similarities because the things that will be done in the first clip to get people to execute at that level, the things that we help and support and train on are exactly the same things that the next individual is actually uh, pushing themselves through. Be fine. I'm fine. I'll do it. Well. Here goes something, I guess. Okay, you can do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snow plow, okay? No snow plows. Keep it straight, you'll be fine. Keep okay. Keep doing the 20. Straight. Do you go faster on the end run? A little bit. A little bit? <laughs> Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much. Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer, just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. a bigger 20. Go ahead. I got it. That's fine. You'll be fine. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. It always huh? seems easier, easier seems after, like after you've done it, doesn't it? And that's what we want to talk about today. The concepts apply equally to everybody. That challenge that's in front of you, that may seem inaccessible at a given point in time, there's a lot of little simple tools, just like that young girl was demonstrating, the confidence, the self-talk, breaking down the, pro the, the problem into subsets, things like that. But the first one I think we'll anchor on and uh, maybe uh, kick this off with is fundamentally we want to start right at the basis. Who are you? What do you stand for? And the real message in, in this sort of conversation is when we're working with the very uh, best talents, the idea of why have they gotten to this point in their life? What is it that they really want to understand about themselves and how do they develop those character values and, 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 and characteristics, if you like, that allow them to anchor themselves no matter what the situation. So no matter how bad, how tough, how crazy, how scary they may find that particular challenge that's laid out in front of them, how do you anchor yourself? And understanding who you are and what you really stand for is that very first step. You don't need to have a full answer to it, but you just start to need to think about that. Because when all hell breaks loose and everything goes sideways, you're going to default to those basic value propositions that you hold yourself at uh, uh, attainable to. And that's why it's an important question to ask and sort of the foundational element of everything we do. Yeah, you know, again, you know, when you step into the culture of the military and why we do what we do and the sense of purpose of mission, uh, what drives us to do things in combat that you wouldn't normally do, you know, part of it's training and, and, and a reactionally aspect, but part of it is, you know, the moral courage and the purpose of mission of why you're sitting, you know, in that space doing what you're doing, service to others that can't help themselves, whether it's a hostage rescue, whether it's an intelligence gathering piece, but, but you understand that reality of, of the situation and actually you find in very, very complex situations, your decisions become very clear and easy and quick when you really default to those moral values and sense of purpose. So again, you know, a unique aspect about Felix Baumgartner and the challenges of that, you know, that multiple years, amazing technology, jumping out of a capsule from space and everything, in the end, it's a decision that an individual makes to make that step. In the very end, that, that whole thing could funnel and Andy can talk about it a little bit, and it funneled twice. And it was all about grounding him in a sense of purpose. And I don't know, Andy, if you want to highlight that real quick. Well, it was, uh, most of you saw the Stratos, but probably didn't see the full build out. It was a seven year program. 
but twice during the program he spoke openly about Felix as his personal challenges, how it became overwhelming. We had to stop the pl program because of that. He was basically had a, having a bit of a breakdown around oh, lots of issues, but fundamentally it was a conversation we had with him around how does he, who, how, who, what does he stand for? How does he want to be remembered? We sat down and literally the conversation went, hey, you're going to have a point of reflection 10, 20, 30 years ahead of this moment. We get to share this moment back to whoever it is, your kids, your family, your grandkids. How does you want that story to go? No right or wrong, no judgment, but think about that now. And that was the sort of anchoring him back into that moment of what he really set out to achieve and why he wanted to do it. And that brought him back. And there was obviously a lot of other things in there, but that was a fundamental part. But part of that leads into this next slide here, which is uh, this curve. And this is, no matter what we talk about today, the science and the technology, they, the values anchor you, and this is the Yerkes Dobson curve, and they anchor you in this space very, very groundedly. And the notion is that, who, 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 who has seen this before? Anybody familiar with this curve? All right, so a quick explanation. You see the performance up on the, on the vertical and arousal or stress or excitement along the bottom? This is a natural human instinct. You can't get around it. It's, uh, it's fundamentally built into our DNA. It's evolutionary. You've heard of flight and fight, or flight or fight? This is the mechanism, you know. When you get to a certain point, you've got to make a quick decision. Are you going to stand up? The body gets breathing fast. The heart starts racing. Blood starts pumping to the muscles. Gets you ready to do one or two things. Either run away or fight. And uh, this is the fundamental mechanism of it. There can be a moment where you're too relaxed. You know, you're not, not enough going on. The boss hasn't given you a deadline, so you take your time. Or... 20 deadlines all stacking on top of each other at the end of an important quarter and you really find yourself way over to the other side, of the left side of the curve there, uh, or to the right as you look at it, and that is also dysfunctional. You can't get a good performance out of that. So we're going to also, we talk about this all day, but we also want to get you moving again. So get, bring the lights on, please. We'll get everyone to stand up. Bring the lights up. Stand up as well. Okay, turn to somebody, and actually, before I say that, complete silence, please. Complete silence. We don't want anyone laughing their way out of the uncomfortableness of this. I feel the tension already rise as soon as I said that. So we're going to walk you along that curve a little bit. So turn to someone you don't know, reach out quietly and take their hand. Just reach out and take their hand. Just one person. Uh -uh. Shh, 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 Look them in the eye, don't look away. Maintain eye contact. Slowly gets a little bit more uncomfortable. <laughs> Move in a little closer. No more laughter. Reach over, give them a big hug. <laughs> hold the hug, hold the hug. <laughs> hold the hug. No more laughter. It's got to get to complete silence and we'll spend the next 30 minutes like this. <laughs> It's only 20 seconds. All right, we'll let you off the hook. Sit down, OK? <laughs> Photographer. OK, OK. <laughs> At a hey, minimum. Real, real quick, you, you guys should all get to know Chucky over here, because some of the photos he just captured are going to be absolute gold. <laughs> There's two guys in the front row that one guy's awkwardly smiling, everyone would look like you just want to punch him in the face. So, so as, uh, 
at a minimum, at nothing else, you've met, met, made a new friend in this presentation. <laughs> so, um, so the idea of how people move, move people along that curve is what coaching is all about. At mo there's certain moments as a coach or a trainer or someone as a manager where you want people to lift their game and you sort of give them a little nudge, you give them a little support, maybe a little bit of a challenge. And there's other moments when you're dialing back the tension and pressure. And what we did just then, who didn't feel uncomfortable? No, one or two, yeah. Maybe they're <laughs> hugging their friends. So it's very easy, and this is always being mindful of what we talk about. This is the model, this is the model you're working against. You're always working getting to get the most out of people because you don't want them down the bottom because you're not just, you know, they're just, you don't know what they've got left, you don't know their capabilities, they haven't been pushed enough, you don't know what's in the, in the, in the tank. You certainly don't want them over the top because it's uncomfortable, it can be in a, in a chronic situation, like long-term chronic stress will kill you, so you, you guys probably all know that, that, that story. What you're looking for is really this space in the, in the ideal in the middle there. You're looking to try and na navigate and modulate the pressure on someone to get them to right to that edge. But actually, if you really want them to improve, you've got to get them just over the edge. And the fundamental mechanism in play there is if I don't push you or we don't push you as a group or an individual to that point where things start to go wrong, we just don't know what you've got in the tank. We don't know how much capability or capacity is in that system. And the human body, in, as in all things, only adapts when you get and to that edge where it's struggling, it has to re-engineer itself, and the biology of the system allows you to shift that curve up into the right so you can handle higher stakes, higher stress, higher performance. Make sense? And, and I might add just quickly, you know, in a room of entrepreneurs, you might think this doesn't apply to me. It applies to you probably more so than a lot of other communities that are thinking about this. And many of you, as entrepreneurs building something, live on the right side of that curve in a state of extreme stress. And you know full well either yourselves or with friends of yours that have gone too far that way, what it does to the, to the psyche. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. And again, this, just this afternoon, the breathing exercises we'll do in the workshop after, we'll show you how to navigate, because the fundamental technique to bring yourself from the far right back to the middle is fun based around breathing. That's the first step we teach. Hey, the only other thing in that, you know, with Brian's comment about this, think of this from a leadership perspective or developing your organization or your team or whatever aspect it is. So you can do this to yourself by allowing yourself to let people do things and you kind of stay on that fence of risk. And you, you can pick, you know, what things you can kind of allow people to fail at. And pretty soon you're building a team that's really kind of living in the green and really working at an optimal level. And, you know, part of that is developing leadership underneath you and allowing people to do that. And that's, that's a critical piece of really high performing teams. And you learn that experientially besides just listening to a brief or talking to folks. And, and there's a very unique way of doing that, but I would absolutely, you know, argue that's one of the best techniques of developing leaders. Yeah, and as a manager, you don't have to take the risk yourself in their organization. The leadership doesn't take the risk. They distribute the risk across the organization, so you can select across your communities within the organization who you allow to go over the edge a little or who you feel like you, that aren't quite ready for that. So you can, you can mitigate the risk on yourselves as leaders, especially if you have a larger organization. And most importantly, as you start to allow people to push that edge and they feel confidence, and you've always got to support them, but in that supported way, they'll start to feel like they can take and come up with more ideas, new, new, new projects, systems, whatever it may be that you're thinking about trying to do that they would require you to push your business forward. So it's a powerful, powerful model to understand. Um, threat versus challenge is another tool. So this is a really simple one. Reframing, and it sounds overly simple, but it's also very powerful. When that thing in front of you, whatever you're trying to achieve, seems beyond your grasp, you've got two choices. You see it as a threat. Oh my God, I can't do this or I'm going to look like a fool, or whatever that internal self-dialogue may be, or you can take it as an opportunity to learn something about yourself. Uh, Jürgen, you have a great saying for this, you know. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's a bunch of ways to look at this, but, you know, every great life lives in this world of chaos, of, of challenge, this dynamic, this, this place of hardship, and, and that's really critical. And if you reflect back, you learn so much. Again, becoming that expert learner and being comfortable in this area. But you know, when you live in a culture that's constantly thinking about this dynamic, that's where, again, you really start pushing the edge and you find out where you can push that edge a little bit deeper. And you say win or, what's the win or lose, or what's that phrase? So yeah, when you, when you think about a performance mindset, there's never really win or lose, it's, it's win or learn. So you're in this mindset, obviously, of always learning. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But when you grow up in a culture where after every evolution you do, you have a learning experience, so, you know, Again, folks that 
know this intuitively on the audience, you know, after action reports or lessons learned, every training evolution you do, every operation you do, every mission you do, immediately the first thing you do is you have a very transparent, respectful, and open way of how, as the entity, both an individual and the team, actually failed or learn great things. And you re actually, one of the amazing things about that is you reconstruct a situation from different perches because no matter what, everyone sees the end state or the flow of the operation differently. And that's where teams really begin to learn. And as soon as that culture begins, that mindset um, develops this process, very disciplined process of learning after every evolution, you become an amazing high performing organization, team, whatever it may be in whatever field. And it's that mindset, that culture then begins this, this amazing sense of communication through transparency, trust, and respect of others that sometimes doesn't exist in any organizations. And one of the ones that Brian and I see this just clearly, <laughs> very, very clearly is in medicine. And it's amazing, you would think that this occurs more, but actually from a, an OR perspective after an operation, it's kind of just brushed off. And the power of, of reconstructing an operation from different perspectives and learning from this is, is a critical piece. And the amazing thing is too, if you kind of reimagine this learning process, think about how you can do immersive video and VR and, and as Andy's saying, and, and you just experienced, all that data being collected of your heart rate and stress and breathing and sweat overlaid with going through a visual evolution of learning and things like that. I mean, the so I, think, I think we got some videos for that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. So maybe so we'll jump into. We'll the, talk about that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, fantastic. So, as the, with everything, you can talk all day about it. So we were in the business of making it actionable and giving people that experience. So, well, it's the number one fear in, in, in America for most people: public speaking. So we put a little gasoline on that exercise. So we partner. We've had a great relationship with many years with Cirque du Soleil, and we've uh, they have a whole range of amazing uh, training evolutions that are. In, bring you up on stage and basically put you through a different type of scenario, kind of like I said, public speaking on steroids. And so we, book, we do this for everyone. It's a, a powerful evolution. It gives you the taste of what it's like to be completely on the edge. And obviously, there's no uh, challenge from a physical perspective. So we like to develop these tools that allow us to put people in very uncomfortable situations. They learn how to navigate that space on the edge of the curve. And then through those tools, they can then bring it back and apply it to anything. So here's, here's a young group of entrepreneurs and athletes uh, going through a training evolution called, with Cirque. And essentially, they're asking them to get up on stage and explore their emotions in front of a crowd. These are the switch. These are extremes. Laughing and crying. And like we were saying, find your place and find your moment that triggers that emotion and just push it and push it and push it. And then switch. Okay? All right, cry, guys. Cry. Actually getting up in front of a crowd and really letting go and actually showing emotions, laughing and crying and jumping around, screaming, all these energy exercises and all these different things. I felt like that to me was by far the hardest thing ever. Switch, laugh! Laugh! That was close, man! <laughs> I really felt like I was really self-connected with myself and my energy was balanced and everything was, was aligned. So DK there's day job as a big wave surfer at Jaws, 40, 50, 60 foot waves. But he, as he said, that's the hardest thing he's ever had to do. And you also start to see, so you see the power of some of this training. And it's really about bringing people into a space where they have to navigate and develop the tools. But we're always supporting them. And you saw the heart rate monitors. I don't know if you noticed the heart rates in there. We're always giving them that feedback. And the trick is, even if you're preparing for a big board review or a big pitch, major pitch, you get up in front of people as a practice, you can get a heart rate monitor on and look at it. And it's, if you start to learn to really bring that heart rate down as part of your exercise, again, breathing is a simple technique. You've got a tool then that helps you navigate. And you do that through that fundamental idea of this is a challenge. This is not a threat. I'm up here to learn something about myself. And if I take that mindset, then you can grow from there. The next one's assess versus assume. And this is a fun one because this is also an ancient evolutionary model. It's uh, tied back to the days of you know, walking through the woods and you hear a rustle, you know, and you don't know what it is. It's probably safer to either get the hell out of Dodge, assume it's worst case scenario so you can live for another day. Uh, unfortunately, that sticks with us. So humans, in the absence of information, will fill in with worst case scenario. You all agree? You know, what's the worst thing the boss can tell you on Friday afternoon at 5? Not fired. The worst thing he tells you is meet me at 9 o'clock on Monday morning. 
See the difference? That whole weekend, what are you going to think? Oh, he's probably going to congratulate me about something, you know? <laughs> so this might be my bonus early or something. That's not the thought most people would have. So we train this, and uh, it's a powerful tool. And this is one of the things we learned from uh, the, the community Brian worked in, obviously. It's a, it's a powerful tool that they train and train over again. So you get past this point of assumption, jumping to the worst case scenario, to assessing and taking in relevant information. Do you want to say anything? No, I mean, I, I think in today's environment, these, I mean, particularly, again, as entrepreneurs, in a, I, I think the, all of this, these evolutionary models are exacerbated in a world of social media and, and more and more information where we... We are constantly taking in signals from other parts of the world, from other communities, and making our own assumptions and learning how to be very precise in our own assessments is vital. Yeah. And, and again, that person in the meeting, think about it in that context, that you've, you've been spending months on that presentation, you're about to get up to do your big pitch, and it's five minutes in on the first slide, someone challenges you. What's the assumption? Asshole, you know, why do they want my job? They're trying to make me look bad, you know. The reality could be they've had a bad day, they may just not understand it, but people typically jump to that other, other side of the shop. So to train that, we, you've got to get better at it, you've got to practice it. And in this scenario here, we've got the same group of athletes and entrepreneurs together, and we walk them into a room and ask them, well, I'll let the video explain, it's probably a bit more clear. For us, fear is not a bad thing. It's actually a tool, it's a trigger. It brings you up, and in many cases, it, you need to be brought up to get ready to do what it is you're about to do. I knew I was scared of snakes, but um, I've never actually put myself in a position where I had to be near them. Remember the two things, slow movements, <laughs> low stress. At first, I, I was doing my deep breaths and I almost didn't really sink in what I was doing. Apparently, I, I kind of charged. Everyone else was taking their time and I just wanted to get through there. My heart rate went from sitting down beforehand at 37 to 170 while I was just crawling in there. Learning to face that kind of primal fear and having the experience of feeling probably the most fear I've felt and overcoming it and how amazing that feels afterwards just gives us the confidence to do that again and again. So what's the assumption there? Scared of, Scared of snakes. Snake, bite, death. But these are world-class athletes. We try to consider ourselves that we set up training evolutions that can't put them in harm's way. What would the assessment be? I can't kill them, can we? We can't kill them. So, yeah, if, you, if you've jumped in front of that box to the thought, oh my God, snake, bite, death, the, the, the reality check you can make to yourself, well, okay, take in the information, pay attention, don't get overwhelmed by that anxiety. If you notice the snakes, if, and you can see it very clearly if you paid attention, that snakes had little rubber bands around their mouths, so they could, couldn't actually bite at all. They were fed and all the rest of their boas, so they don't bite really typically anyway. And the whole thing was gamed up. So putting people in the situation to have them, as she's a world-class triathlete, you see how powerful with the absence of information and, and when they don't navigate that space with a, the right, paying attention to the right information, her heart rate went to 170, you know. So that gives you a sense of how much in all these tools can be effective and also the importance of how to navigate them with your own people. The next one is unknown. Ah, oh, sorry. The next one, um, sorry, I'll click through that. Uh, I'll throw this over to Brian, because this is about the medical program. Yeah, so we'll, we'll show you a shot here of uh, some work Jurgen and I did with a group of, of world-class surgeons. But, you know, again, we think about these lessons, this is not meant to be things that feel inaccessible. You know, oftentimes we talk about limitless, you, you show the extreme of a snake. We all have fears. There, there's things in each of our own days, whatever we do as an entrepreneur, that are maybe smaller that we start with. And, but one thing more than any other up here that I believe deeply we're all struggling with is being comfortable with ambiguity. You think about the way the world has evolved. I, we don't have time for a longer video. I just want to share with you a quote uh, from John Seeley Brown. So, this, so he, John Seeley Brown is an amazing thinker who's talked a lot about the evolution and impact of technology in today's world and how that's changing the way that we interact, particularly those of us who are running companies and building companies. And this was very, very relevant when Jurgen and I are both in the military. He says, those of us who design organizations today have to step back and realize that for the last 100 years, the West became powerful because we could actually build institutions 
that understood how to leverage scalable efficiency. We knew how to scale things, but to make things scalable, they had to become predictable. Predictability was the coin of the realm. But here's the dirty secret. Those very things that made us so successful for the last 50 or 60 years are the very things that stand in our way today because they no longer work because we don't have predictability. And so particularly building companies or running companies, the lack of predictability forces us to be comfortable with the unknown, with ambiguity. And so again, working with a group, this is a group of world-class heart surgeons. And we did some pool work with them, some, some of the breathing exercises we'll do with some of you afterwards. Uh, as they got more comfortable, right, some of these folks had never been in the ocean before. And so we took them out to the Pacific Ocean, put a uh, scuba diving mask on them, and blacked that mask out so they had no idea where they were at. They could just hear the waves behind them. And their teammates were waiting at the water line. They weren't allowed to talk, and we walked them out to neck deep water. And so you can imagine what you start to see physiologically, the fear there and how people begin to explore those edges in the unknown. And this is, it ends up being a very powerful exercise. And just to anchor on that, think of it as a manager. One of the worst things you can do to people is put them in a situation with less information. If you're not being communicating effectively what you really intend to are and what you want to get done, you're leaving people a, a kind of sense of unknown. You're not giving them all the idea, all the information relevant. You're creating an anxiety play, a state of anxiety for them. And it may be, per it may be deliberate for certain reasons, but you've always got to be aware as you're communicating to a group or managing a group that your actions and the information you're sharing can either establish a state of stress or can be supportive. So anything there? Yeah, I think yeah. Jurgen's got, uh, yeah, I, the only that thing up. I'd say is that this was, Jurgen built a career, I would say, on being brilliant in this space. Um, and I, I say that very seriously because there's, when you go into uh, any combat zone, there are so many unknowns and being comfortable. And, and so how on the front end do you prepare yourself to be comfortable there? Yeah, we'll add that on an upcoming slide. So respond versus react. So one of the sort of things we like to also get people to think about is how to navigate this sort of in initial reaction to anything. So the idea that a reaction, and the difference here being a, a reaction is sort of non-directional, it's just random. A response is more directional, moves you towards your goal. Ultimately, they become one and the same, where you've trained enough that they become the response. Is the, the reaction you have is the right and accurate response. But the real power to this idea is that, again, if, you ref, you know, if, you're, if you're grounded in your values, if you see the challenge in front of you is exactly that, it's not a threat, it's a challenge, it's something to learn, you take in the information that's relevant, so you don't make assumptions, you judge and assess the situation clearly, you're then in a position to go, okay, breathe, move, make a decision that's appropriate in that case. And so this is a really powerful tool. Again, it's kind of where, again, it's like everything we talk about. You've got to train it, you've got to practice it, you've got to get creative with this. And so for all of these evolutions that we're sharing with you, the idea that these things, again, don't apply broadly, they apply exactly to that same little girl at the beginning. She's doing this on her own. We try to just set up training to help support that along. So this is a nice training evolution. And this, these, are, these are all the highlight reels. So you guys going to get to see all the painful work in the background. There's teams of people navigating these concepts. We're training them to the concepts. But we also like to create what we call an anchor experience for every one of our big training evolutions. So a training evolution in this particular case lasted over a week. We always want to give them something they can always remember. One, because it's fun and they should enjoy it. It's, you know, it's, it's a, it's all, it doesn't have to be super serious all the time. But two, it's something they can always reflect back on. And I'll let the guys talk about their early selection process. But in this particular case, the athletes and, our, and the entrepreneurs have been out in the woods all week. We've been running them around. We've been doing all sorts of training. And then finally, we sit them down for the final hike on the last day. So we're setting up the anticipation a little. And then I'm giving them the world's worst lecture on hydration and it's boring and it's hot and you can see by their faces no one's even paying attention, which is exactly what we're after. And then, uh, yeah, the video speaks for itself. We're gonna have uh, <laughs> easy. Listen carefully because you guys will all be interacting tactilely with him. <laughs> Success. <laughs> See, uh, 
intense weather or whatever may be the the, uh, the, the butts of your hand because you're <laughs> oh, uh, because the butts of your can you see now a, a calming for uh, 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 Jennifer in his end uh uh and God <sighs> bro you're crazy you're gonna <laughs> you get the general idea so. To be clear, so that we, it took us a week to train that bear to run at him. Um, and it's the bear out of all the movies, that's Bart, if you weren't familiar. But the funny thing was, it, 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 we couldn't let them really run because a few of them were going to the Olympics in a couple of weeks. So we actually had to stop them so they didn't run through something and break a leg or something like that. Except for the reporter, I don't know if you caught the CNN reporter, she went over the fence and twisted herself <laughs> up. But we didn't think about her, we didn't care. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But um, the idea is the two guys in the front who hadn't, didn't run away, have actually had the most training. So they were able to sit up, see the bear running at them, make a decision and go, okay, what's Andy up to now? And what's the team up to? All right, if I stand my ground, I'm probably good. And so that idea, and making it fun and experience, but I'll throw it over to Jürgen there for that sort of conversation. Yeah, I mean, we just did the same thing with a bunch of elite ultra endurance athletes. And um, I mean, these guys are, doing the 100 to 200 mile races through the Alps. And it was just amazing experience to, to see how they respond versus react when we're just kind of walking and blindfolding them in and talking about the, what's going on in their head and what the self-talk is. So a lot of it's self-talk that gets you to that stuff. And then if you're not training through what you're observing right away, you're just absolutely gonna react by just kind of respond and, and think of it logically. And, and I always go back to it and we're gonna talk about it here in the next coming slides, it's, it's the discipline to train yourself to do that stuff because everyone can do it. And it's just a matter of the discipline to train at that point. Yeah, so um, as you see, the training evolutions that we do and the th experiences that we're trying to put people through, of course, if the, these elite people have to be exaggerated, but the, think about how you can take some of these concepts and put people in spaces that may be a little uncomfortable, maybe force some of these dialogues, and most importantly, they feel supported. So as Jürgen said earlier, afterwards, you're always asking them, what did they experience? How did they go through it? How did they get through it? And those types of things. But this is a big one, and I'll let Jürgen speak to focus and discipline because it's, it's critical. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. So the dynamic here was this was an operation that we had, and I'm sitting there under the hut on the radio trying to, trying to talk to people under the rotor wash of some guys coming down. Uh, we were doing an operation at about 12,500 feet. We were go working through two different valleys, going after a group sitting in a cave somewhere, and um, it went sideways pretty quick. We lost a helo. Helo went down. So I'm trying to work a medevac for some guys that are injured. We had another guy get blown off a cliff. And the challenge with all this was there was no place to land a helo. You know, uh, when we were going in, it was just a fast rope, which is sliding down that big green rope there on the side. And going back to the points that Andy just made and that Brian just made about communications and, and this, this thought process and this mindset of dealing with contingencies, both from a cognitive aspect, but also a psychological aspect, you know, goes through just multiple, multiple iterations. And it's all about that performance mindset of how you prepare your attitude and your effort towards what your end state is. And it's, it, you could take almost uh, the definition of mental toughness, which to me is this driven aspect in your mind towards mission accomplishment, whatever that mission is, over the desire of comfort. And you think about that in everything you do, you know, what, again, back to the point of anchoring yourself, what drives you to that mission end state where you just discard this comfort? Now, of course, in our community, we take it to the extremes. And, and it goes back to what was mentioned earlier, and I'm sure what was mentioned this morning. It's, it's this mindset of going through understanding what the outcome is and always striving to achieve that outcome. And this was uh, about two days evolution, which are usually, you know, the things we do are just in and out really quick. But it was all about the process of thinking things in steps and, and acting small and understanding that there's key tasks that take you to that area. And if you just get overwhelmed on the, the outcome and not think about the process that gets there, that's it, you get kind of laser focused on that. Where if you think of it in steps, all of a sudden creativity, your vision kind of opens up and you have a different perspective of things. So the critical aspect here is this overwhelming communication that's going on. You're absorbing tons of information in both ears and then communicators on both sides talking to different entities. You have you know, different layers of aircraft and maneuver elements coming down. You have this problem set going on. You have people moving through two valleys. And then you're trying to send folks to go after your primary target. 
Um, how do you deal with that communication? How do you filter out emotion and overwhelming you know, cognitive load? And how do you train to that? And then more importantly, as we're talking about the kind of the future of human performance, and it's the same thing today with everyone else, you think about the load that's coming in of, of information overload that you're absorbing every day. Think of the future with robotic dogs, swarms of drones and bees going into buildings or many, many layers of that. How do you train to that? And how do you think about focusing on more the cognitive realm? Because we always think of what we do in the physical realm, but it's really the cognitive training that we're taking to a whole nother level. And that's really the critical factor, I think, of the future. I'll turn over to Brian for any other comments you no, have. The only thing I want to add here is you can see this and hear you're going to talk and maybe dismiss it and say, look, I wasn't tracking high value targets in Afghanistan. The reality, though, I think, again, special operations to be given sometimes more credit than due. But one thing that I was always humbled by was the complexity of you've got helicopters and satellites and different communication channels and different layers of people on the ground. And this ability to be very focused and disciplined on what matters, how do we train to get there so that when we're there, we know what matters. But then to simplify, in, in the face of ambiguity, to simplify things. What Jurgen's doing in that hut, communicating, is focusing on what his first priority is, what really matters, what am I here for? And we bring that back to the theme of limitless, right? And everything that we're after here in our businesses or whatever it may be, and it comes to back to that focus and discipline, and particularly, being disciplined in how we communicate across our teams, which is just absolutely vital in today's world. That's fantastic. Um, I've been fortunate, and we're working together on a bunch of different programs right now, but recently these guys uh, have brought me in, and we've been all talking about the world of performance and precision medicine, and uh, again, another highly dynamic, robust environment where things are moving quickly and obviously life and death consequences in, in a different realm. So Brian, why don't you uh, throw over to that? Yeah, so that, remember that first image Andy put up with a question mark? And we said one of the things that's beautiful about today's world is that we live in a time where we're, st we're able to train in ways that we weren't capable of even 10 years ago. So when we talk about pushing our edges and we talk about fear and ambiguity, it was really tricky to train these things. But because of the way technology has evolved, we're in any community now, we're starting to understand how we do that differently. So the Cleveland Clinic Heart and Vascular Institute, they've been ranked number one in the world for 25 years in heart surgery. But one of the hard things about heart surgery is the way they train is if you're a resident in heart surgery, you train by looking over the shoulder of a, excuse me, the shoulder of a surgeon, and then one day you're given the scalpel. And so how do we prepare you for a moment where something goes wrong? or where something starts to fall apart, like a code, a patient dying on the table. So this is using 360 degree video to create real life simulations of just that occurrence. To the team, you'll see the view switching here. The, one of the powers of this technology is that we can show you the viewpoint of multiple members of the team. And so you're in an immersive environment, but we can put you in anesthesia perspective, in the scrub nurse perspective, and, and put you right in the middle of an emergency. So knowing what a smart guy you are, I'm gonna assume that you've made some correct decisions here, um, but really this is, would be the start of a scenario that's designed to get the resident in the mode, excited, fearful, and feeling what it's really like to be managing an emergency. So at that point, what we do essentially is to utilize multiple scenarios that come from a real operation um, that are divided up into short video clips. And so we can take the resident down sort of a choose your own adventure book of making the right or the wrong decisions. But we'll, uh, we'll assume that uh, Jim has made the right decision. And uh, we'll stop it there. So that, that's the, the director of the new medical school, the Cleveland Clinic, in a headset. You're actually seeing what he's seeing. He feels like he's inside that surgery. And a really important point to note here is that you know, one of the things we often talk about, technology is not a panacea or a solution. We still have to have the human factors and understanding and be able to train those. But now we can bring technology in to go to that next level. And again, this becomes equally applicable when we start talking about how we train hard things in, in our own lives as entrepreneurs. And one of the things I've learned watching these guys in this environment is that, and it's always repeated across all the examples you've seen, people like to practice what they're good at and practice in perfect scenarios. But training on the edge means picking scenarios that are the worst case that you potentially face. So even walking through with your staff uh, uh, in through the contingencies that are required if things go badly, like check this, check that. Not, hey, it, it all, everyone looks like a hero when it goes according to the business plan, but how do you practice and train, the question to you guys, for times in that plan where things aren't working out and start thinking about how to prepare for those moments. Uh, with that, we'll uh, sort of flip it back to Brian again, I think, because this is another example of how the practice creates one set, but the, how, how do you learn given this case study? 
So use Jurgen's adage here, be becoming an expert learner. And one of the beautiful things, again, about the nexus of technology and these first principles, the human factors we're talking about, when we start to bring that together, we can do extraordinary things. And so quickly, there's a legacy. Every one of us has legacies in the work we do. In medicine, there's a legacy. When you're a senior surgeon, you don't often interact a lot with residents. They, you expect them to look over your shoulder and learn. And so what you're going to see is a video of the director of trauma at the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, DC. This is, if you guys remember, uh, tragically, a year and a half ago, there was a congressional baseball game that where an active shooter uh, injured a number of people. So they all went to, to Jack Sava's operating room. You're going to see Dr. Jack Sava, the chair of trauma, and one of his residents. And this is a very unique moment where they're both wearing those headsets, again, that you just saw, watching a trauma of an abdominal stabbing from the night before, and they're learning real time together. And so think about the, this ability to become an expert learner in real time. She's describing what she's seeing and what she would be doing. Can we pause? Yeah. So we've agreed we're laughing at this guy, right? Yes. Okay. So how does the back wound change our plans? Well, if you're concerned with the back stab wound, uh, so thoraco abdominal injury, so we can stop it there. So she's talking about this is a backstabbing wound. What am I learning? He's questioning her. And this becomes this beautiful opportunity, less than 24 hours, to learn from something real time together. Incredibly powerful in terms of, of the time we live in. Did you want to say anything, Yeah. Yeah, the only thing, again, it comes back to creativity and innovation and, and this really mindset of how can we learn, you know, this mindset of hacking, but how can we learn more effectively? and faster with applied technologies today. And more importantly, how do you get upstream of that? So you can apply this to all different measures, probably out in your fields and your creative minds of how you can do this, but always constantly thinking in that sense will just take you to that next level. And I think these guys have hit it, but I'll say it again just to be clear. The, the idea that technology is an enabler nowadays, it allows us to understand more about the human, but there's always the human element. And from our experience in the more recent years is we're seeing people so, Em emboldened by the technology in their hands or the cap capability to present in certain ways that they're forgetting about that true element of the individual and what it takes to bring someone along or the team along. So the, the understanding of the human in the equation is really where we're anchoring ourselves moving forward. We call it humanizing the human moving forward. Let the technology support be powerful as it is in this case to really enable high level of training and learning, but always make sure that there's a person in the loop and with all you people in the room, there's people in all your loops. How do you Think about them in the context of getting the most out of them in a supportive and productive way. And this sort of brings us full circle, which is, we mentioned at the beginning, who are you, what do you stand for, which is really a question around what are your character, what are your values, how do you really want to live up to that individual person you want to be? And I think we all agree if, over the years, no matter what field of human endeavor, the very best talent have this really high level of self-awareness and, and humility is a deep character stick across them all. And it's not humble in that, hey, they don't celebrate their own success. They may appear very, to have a high ego in that sort of equation, but the humility is how are they always prepared to make sure they don't get ahead of themselves. They're always prepared to think of themselves as having something more to learn, as Jürgen said earlier. They're, they're, they have that beginner's mindset. And so I'm going to show you a couple of clips here. And the first one is someone performing something extraordinary, but then we'll discuss how the humility plays in it in the second one. Throw up this kite and down JT goes. I saw these majestic turns that he made. Uh, I'm thrilled because Martin Babler, the Cineflex guy in the front seat, is taking these pictures and JT never goes out of frame. And then he hits the snowfield and starts to ski at 40 miles an hour. And I said, oh my God, oh, he doesn't fall, he has no poles. Comes right to the edge of the mountain, and it, poof, right off the top of the mountain. He made it. So what has humility got to do with that? So probably what you don't know is he tried to do that again and had some issues. And, and, okay. Yeah, so, so the one thing about humility, and Andy just mentioned it too, is the same thing that, you know, when we look at in very elite organizations, it's this term elite versus elitist. So if you're living in an elite organization, it's almost a self-accountability piece that you're always pursuing the sense of excellence and performing at the top standard. 
and having the humility to always have either a beginner's mind so you can absorb, but more importantly, even in the most uh, advanced you know, special operations organizations doing the most complex things, there's this mindset that you're always being selected, which in reality is the case because you can always be la you know, asked to leave whether it's a lapse in character traits or skill set. But th it's this mindset where you're constantly absorbing and learning around you and having the humility that everything you do is, is contributing to the team performance. Everything you do, it's never about you. It's always about we as the team. And it's always about the actions of the team, especially when you live in an organization that has no fail missions. So having that humility and respect of doing that. And then the only other thing I'll say about humility is, is the equation of equaling respect. Because you know, you go to Afghanistan and these guys have been fighting for a very long time in their backyard. And they look very basic, but the amazing thing is they can be very powerful with one, one aspect, one tactic, one location, whatever the case may be against all these guys coming in with all this technology and, and, and amazing firepower and techniques and practices, whatever the case may be. But it's always having that respect for others that allows you to always be thinking forward and thinking with the sense of respect and humility to actually absorb and learn the situation and environment. And I think this is point out, and this is not to say that JT in this particular next video, which is he decided he did that and he decided it went well, I'll go up again and have another go. Now that's obviously, uh, you know, he's a, he's a world-class athlete, world-class talent. I'm not saying he wasn't humble, but you always want to check yourself about when you're doing things right at the edge that you never want to get, as I said, get ahead of what you think you're capable of doing. When the risks are high, the risks are high, and you want to navigate that space with a very high degree of humility, understanding the risk, making sure you're paying attention to the risk because it doesn't always work out. It started off fine. Went down the mountain, everything's going great. And he went over his little man-made ramp. And I see him flying in the air, and I see one ski go, but I don't see a second one. He couldn't jettison one of his skis. One of his skis got stuck. Uh, this was death defying. If that ski did not come off, he would have died. He had about uh, two seconds, maybe, where he couldn't get it off. You know, I'm, I'm trying to film this, but inside, your heart's like going, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, come on. Thankfully, he was able to get that ski unstuck, and it flew away, and uh, he continued with his free fall, and then he deployed his parachute and, and floated safely down. So he did make it. I'm sorry, I heard everyone sucking their breath there, so I didn't mean to set that up that way. But um, we have a saying, uh, you know, pay attention to this. You're never as good as you think you are. So even at the top of your game, and, it's not, and he, he's an extraordinary athlete, and to be able to actually he's, practice and prepare so that he actually was able to have a clear head and think where the problem was, reach down in under two seconds and fix it, shows you the world-class talent he is. But there's always that, you know, when you guys know you're pushing the edge in your business world or wherever other aspects of your life, pay attention when you are out on the edge that you're not taking things for granted. Yeah, this is, you know, Andy and Jurgen and I talk a lot about first principles of high performance. So Elon Musk has popularized this more recently. What are the first principles of a problem? If I'm going to space or I want to create photovoltaic energy, it goes all the way back to the days of Aristotle, boil something down to its most basic elements. Say so unequivocally, the first principle of high performance, of pushing your own limits, is humility. And it's not humility that says don't be bold or braggadocious, but no matter how good I am, I can be better. You know, it's amazing we go into these world-class organizations, Cleveland Clinic, Art and Basker Institute, like I said, number one in the world for 25 years, and they're saying, hey, can you guys come help us think about how to push the edge a little more? We were outside in the lobby talking to Jesse earlier, and, and he says, hey, how, how do I start to work with you guys? How, how can I learn from you? Just this hunger, right? And one of the things that was really powerful last night, we had an interesting experience, I think it's okay if I share this, but uh, we spent the day yesterday with the Atlanta Falcons, and. Andy's done a number of work and very close to their leadership. And so they, you know, Andy is extraordinary at breaking down any organization and saying, here, did you ever think about X or Y? And so their general manager would really want to sit with us, but is in the midst of, of renegotiating a contract with Matt Ryan, which is a, a very big deal. And so he still ends up, we go to dinner, Henry was kind enough to host us for dinner, and he ends up breaking away when he has a break, and he, he punches over to the restaurant just to sit with us for 15 minutes and say, hey guys, what did you learn? What can we be doing better? And it's such a powerful anecdote for life, because here's someone in the midst of maybe the biggest contract in history in the NFL, stepping away saying, how can I make my team and my organization better? It's just, and it's amazing how you see that, again, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an elite operator, or in medicine, and it's this common theme of the humility to want to be better. 
No, I, I, again, I always just say, you're grounded in your sense of purpose and the values and ethics which really drives really high performers. And those, and, and if you, you'll look and you'll see it, those people that really perform to a whole nother level, whether it's in, in, in an interview or more importantly, actions speak louder than words, it's distributed through their actions, which is, Brian said, you know, and you could see it when he came in and it was just passionate about learning and, and a perspective from someone else. So again, through your actions, you're distributing that lesson to others as a leader. Um, so again, you're always keeping yourself accountable to your actions 24 hours a day as a leader. And that's just, a, I think, a critical piece of the humility and beginner's mindset. And so for sort of bring this full circle again, you, you guys are all about pushing the edges in your own domains and pushing the limits and limitless as a topic for this conference. Hopefully today we've shared with you some of the simple insights that really aren't that complex uh, that you can apply in your own way. I'll give you some throughput to see how you may interpret some of the information we've shared back to your way. And you will take it and make it your own. We're not here to show you this is what to do. But the beauty of, again, as we said at the beginning of where we are at this point in time is these amazing tools and understanding of what it takes to perform at the top of the game can now be scaled and shared. And so it's our vision, hopefully, in the next few years, that we aggregate all the IP of people like yourselves and other experts around the world in our community, and we bring together all this tacit knowledge around how to bring the best out of people. And one, we obviously hope that we can build a bit of a framework around that for ourselves to operate in, but more importantly, how do we give this all away? How do we share this information in a global scale with all those young children and people like the young girl at the beginning who are uh, pushing their own edges so they don't have to navigate it in their own way and figure it out for themselves. We give them a bit of a nudge up. So that's where we want to give you guys some pause to think about and that's what we hope to do in the beginning. But we've got time for a bit of a couple of questions. So I don't know if we bring the lights up if anyone has a couple of questions, but that's, that's us for the day. So uh, before we move into the next one. Does anyone have any questions that we've done all the talking? Andy. Right? You're Andy yep. in the center. Yep. I'm curious, as an outsider, you go into the US ski team, what would you say you kind of change? Like what, if, if people are talking about you, like Andy came in and did something, what, what would you say was the change you created? Um, well, it's never one person to it. It's easy to get, I was probably the guy with a funny accent, and that's why I get a bit of the credit. But the reality was there was a whole mechanism in place that I was part of. There was this whole, re-engineering re thanks to the athletic director at the national level there who's saying we want to bring a bit more science to the program, we want to bring in a new way of coaching, a new way of educating. We did a lot of this training and various forms of that. So the whole team got on board. There was a, a, a new energy in thinking about doing things differently as an organisation. So it's when you get the organisation on board to think about pushing the boundaries. One or two people can have good ideas or different approaches, but it's when the whole organisation has to get around. So I think it was the impetus of embarking on this new idea of thinking about human factors in a different way, but organisationally, coaching and, and, and the whole mechanism of support that went into it, better training facilities, etc., that brings that energy together. And that's, that's how you, you move. It starts with small and it grows throughout the group, and that's, that's I, I think, the best explanation of why the, the program improves so much. Hi, gentlemen. Um, I've got a question that, you know, I've read like Tim Ferriss's books on like the four hour, you know, hacks and so forth. And it's really based around like life hacks and understanding what are the, what are the critical behaviors that you know, in the shortest amount of time. But what I enjoyed it already about the, about the panel and your discussion is that you've added a lot more layers behind. It's not just finding a hack, but uh, can, can you go a little bit more into um, that, that difference between reading about what, you know, and trying to do these particular things in the shortest amount of time in, and, and broaden that to what you're, what, you're, what you're teaching, I guess, high performance teams. Yeah, the, the one thing I always go back to is, you know, nothing is gained without doing some hard work. So it, it's, that, it's that mindset of there's ways to enable or catalyze, you know, or accelerate some of that learning but it's repetition in DNA. We always say, you know, when we do some of these amazing things, any, any high performer, especially when you talk about this, this morning's uh, keynote speaker, um, he never rose to the occasion. He always fell back on his training. And it's that mindset of constantly training and, and the correct type of training, and as, as was highlighted, training in much more difficult situations than the reality. And if you're always thinking in that sense, instead of always trying to find that shortcut, that's kind of, that's a high performance mindset versus a mindset that's just looking for the perfect 
conditions, the perfect situation, the immediate you know, hack. So that's how I kind of balance that. I mean, there's great things in there, and Tim you know, provides a lot of different perspectives, but it's still, it's hard work and repetition. And the only thing I'd add is, um, we live in a time when particularly people starting businesses or doing new things that one of the first questions that come up, comes up is how are you gonna scale it? And come to believe that the things that matter most don't scale, in particular when it comes to character and values. And to Andy's point, what mattered most about skydiving from space at the end of the day was who are you? And so that's often, when we talk about hacks, we, we, we jump past this conversation about why are you doing this, to what end? What are you trying to learn about yourself? Um, why do you want more time in your life? And so that, I think, is the beauty of this idea of making the human more human. Forget about technology to scale. Let's use technology to better understand ourselves and who we are and, and, and go deeper. I'm just curious. Um, you guys are all high achievers and done a lot of things with your life and probably got a lot ahead of you. What are you doing right now? If I were to sit across from you at a lunch table and say, what are you doing to expand your boundaries or test yourself mentally or physically? What are those things today that you're working on? Um, I'd be curious to hear that. Yeah, so for me, it's always kind of, you know, even at this age, how do I scare myself? You know, so I can control that. You know, the one unique thing that, that a lot of people realize, and I think it was mentioned earlier, what, and earlier today, I'm sure, um, is you actually thrive in an environment of fear and ambiguity and challenge. And how do you keep that mindset, especially for us that step out of a culture where you're doing that every day, where it's just kind of the norm? And for me, it's ice climbing. I love ice climbing. And I, you know, I, I do that type of thing in climbing in general. That's kind of pushing the edge and still scares me. But absolutely, I can't be scared because I have to focus. So how do you actually use fear to fire the house instead of burn it down, so to speak? And, and that's just one aspect for me. I have twin six-year-old daughters, so that whole thing is terrifying to me. So. <laughs> And the lack of preparedness that people give you, if anyone has kids, I'm obviously repeating to the preaching of the choir, but the lack of preparation you have for that thing is terrifying to me. But I think it, in the way we approach our lives now, and it's something we're all doing now, we're thinking about moving into domains where it's very, you know, when you've got world-class people pushing the edge, the, the subtle of the stuff you saw today becomes inherently part of the system. So you don't have to dwell on it. But how do we um, put ourselves working with different communities now that we've never had any experience to? And so case in point, we're all signed up to do a bunch of work with uh, 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 sort of what we call the cognitive athlete, like people who are spending a lot of time in front of a computer or a screen. And there's some on the government side, and there's also in the esports community, so the professional video game players. So uh, we put ourselves now in a position where we're going to start working with them in, in depth for the next couple of years, because it's a space we know nothing about. And it, I think that always forces us to get better at what we know to improve and support. And so picking things like that for us, I think, would be a general way of saying it's a way to keep us sharp and, and, and always thinking about how to learn more versus just defaulting to uh, running around pushing people off stuff, you know? I, I, first of all, I think it's a phenomenal question that you always, I mean, in this type, but just for authenticity's sake, I, I ask that myself, what, how do, you know, so we don't get up here and preach. Um, there's a relational side of it that's very deep for me. Uh, part of it, the first quarter of this year was insanely busy for us. And I realized that I talk a lot about this idea to be in transformational space rather than just transactional email and keeping up. And yet I wasn't doing that myself. And how do we find time to step back and do things like meditate? We've gotten away from some sort of headspace to go deeper into who I am. Um, so that's a big part of how I've looked at this, this next quarter of this year. That's a sort of tactical answer. Uh, and the other one for me, uh, again, very tactical in the last month. Uh, I've just I've gotten rid of meat out of my own diet. And, and that's like, how do I constantly think about living so that I can be clearer and, and just live a little better? And that gets this idea of experimentation. Uh, so that's for me. Thank you, guys. Thank you very, very much. It was great. Thank you.